well, what semantic web is about and which kind of uh, things we study and um, also about some uh, further developments. Uh, so generally, when you are here, you, uh, I recommend you very much to learn about the basics of the web, if you don't know much about it, but I assume uh, many of you uh, know. Um, if not, I would also post in all the basic presentations about the web, and uh, that, but you should know in principle what is internet, what is web, or what is a web language. Uh, like basics like HTML, uh, so something about this. So if you don't know this, it can be kind of difficult to take the course. I mean, not impossible, but difficult. Um, generally, what is the what do you think the difference between the internet and the web is, and how they are related? Just to test, say, your knowledge. Again, this how we can interact with this. Um, this is also a question on the. Uh, many if you can see it in the chat um, maybe we should put the chat back again Mm -mm. Last semester I was teaching in Webex, so this also Zoom is also new to me, but um, so basically if you think about uh, a difference between web and internet and you ask, for example, well, how they are related, for example, well, this question we discussed also in uh, web services course, but generally, of course, web and internet, uh, well, um, the first thing that, of course, they're not the same. So if you asked out of these three options, uh, you would be, um, the right one is, uh, would be, well, think for a moment. Um, the right one would be, uh, of course, the middle one, um, that the web is application layer on top of internet, because the web is basically based, uh, lies on the internet and uses uh, internet to um, present information. Uh, also, you may have been interested in the development history of the web, where you have um, and the first, uh, basically, systems which were uh, alike to the web were, uh, you may know, they come from as uh, early as, um, well, around the end of the Second World War. They started to do, basically, different models, which led to, uh, in the 60s, um, to the hypertext, um, which is basically was very, very, very um, language already something similar what you use uh, like html or um, also semantic web so you basically could link documents and then there was uh, this interlinking features appeared and um, uh, as the web was uh, created in 1989 as you also may know or guess so this is also even already before some of you uh, most of you were born so for you, for, for you, of course, it's also um, kind of, this is a history, uh, but um, and basically the web, mainly as we mean it by the web, uh, then was in the 90s, it was a huge rollout and uh, systems really started to be worldwide used. And now, of course, we cannot imagine living without it and um, also, online teaching would not be possible, right, without internet and the web. And uh, we have here the systems that, um, well, basically we have the application layer that we can, for example, browse uh, files, uh, documents on the web, but we have uh, basically this protocol infrastructure, which, for example, now stream my voice and my image there, which is, of course, was also, well, uh, of course, when I was a child, it was completely something unimaginable, but people already had a clear understanding. So my mom also was telling, well, you could call your grandma and talk like uh, with the video and uh, over the web. Well, I didn't believe, but um, well, no, no, now I also cannot because the grandma is, of course, they don't live forever. 
but anyway so basically well this this was the history uh, of the web and uh, then um, there was uh, developments were happening just uh, um, that went beyond the um, just this interlinked documents which were on the web so for example if you look what happened um, again when you were born probably well you were born somewhere in the 90s most of you actually it's also the year which um, the it really went exponential the, the whole web and uh, this development and that um, um, basically you have um, different application appearing on different platforms uh, that it became possible to for anybody to post any kind of information on the web and it's really became uh, well because because when it was just normal web with http and html it was difficult well you need to set up a server you need to um, learn how to 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 create html now none of you need to learn this anymore you can just use twitter and publish information or similar platforms yeah facebook and so on so basically it was also called the social web and it uh, it was in the early um, years of this century so it's really everybody could use um the web and this was a very big advantage so basically well between the web and the internet you should clearly understand the difference so internet defines for example internet protocol suit and world is more uh, web is more about uh, the languages like html uh, which run on top of these protocols and um, with this you for example can navigate the web and click on the link and go to the next link so uh generally well you may know you may not know uh the well world wide web appeared in the 90s and uh it was uh also not very far from here it was uh, in CERN in Zurich and um or no it's in Geneva well but still well it's a neighbor country from us and then um there was a person Tim Berners-Lee uh and he basically well he just uh, put together the internet protocols and uh, the hyperlink models hyperlink documents together uh, and he didn't want to invent the web but he did wanted to improve the document management system which they had a turn in the 90s um, and he just put all well, these hyperlink documents and connected them like on globally what you could do on on, on the internet and uh, created a language html and um, this development and basically it lets that we have a web now uh, as of now and it was even his side project so he was not even working well for this it was just he wanted to improve some document system and yeah. it was not his job he's a physicist so this is well how uh, web appeared and in a sense if you think um, why it really took 35 years because or 25 years because the hypertext systems were already um available in the 60s and used in libraries and this uh development only came in the 90s um because all technology was there but uh, just to combine them together well nobody thought about it yeah and this is very interesting yeah because it's uh, clearly something very very extremely innovative yeah as it impacts our lives dramatically now so um well, basically, as I was saying uh, before, it was very difficult to do something with the uh, web because, well, the well development systems look like this, and this is also well uh, when I started, and of course, uh, well in my school, uh, co computers appeared when I was already in school, so my school was quite advanced, but we had had computers. Well, basically, we had to write program lines, and uh, this is um, well, you have to obviously have to some, do some backgrounds on this um, and know how to manage a server and uh, be very clear about this yeah. and this is how also first um, web browsers look like uh, for example it was Netscape also uh, this is the one also well, because I started to use the web uh, just when the web appeared so I uh, obviously was um, um well as soon as it appeared i started to use it and it was on the first programs of to browse the web was for example this one netscape it doesn't exist anymore and generally well we still do browsing even though it, it's already uh, 
20 years, more than 20 years. We are still browsing documents, which is very interesting in a sense, but um, uh, but of course the system became, there, there is many platforms on the market and then there is competition too. Um, so basically the web became very successful because you could hyperlink things. So you can just go from page like this. Yeah, this is 1993, how it looked like back then. You even didn't have a mouse back then, you did it with keyboard, um, but you can go and click on the enter and then you go to the some other web page. So you could also already browse, but with a keyboard. Uh, and then the mouse came and then it's already even scaled uh, up faster because well, with the mouse, it's much more convenient to work clear yeah, than with the keyboard. So it was a very, another very innovative thing in this development. So generally, basically, it's still, um, you had in this time browsers and search engines uh, as the po most popular ways to interact with the web. Now, obviously, it's not the case. Um, it's, it's not anymore 90s. <clears throat> now you interact with the web also, for example, with chatbots, you interact with, um, sensor-based systems, now you have internet of things. So it's actually, you have a much more, um, many more things now as a possibility to interact with the web. Um, just a as a reminder, what you should really know about web 1.0 before you go in this course, I think most of you know it, especially ones who did already some web development or web services courses, but you should understand all well, these concepts and go through basically, well, at the best take, take a tutorial. I will also put a slide deck on explaining basically what is a URI, um, basically this identifier to identify an object, what is HTML and uh, that you go through tutorial and what is a high hypertext transfer protocol. So this is really like the, the three pillars you should know uh, about web 1.0 before you go into this course. So I won't be checking also these things at exam, but um, again, if you don't have a background and you still want to take the course, we'll go really like in the next week or two and take tutorials for those things. Also I put a slide deck for you um, to with all the needed information, which is basic and you need to know because if you don't know this one, uh, well, it will be really well next to impossible for you to, to follow this one um, if you don't understand the basics of the web. So this is just for information. So I would not be going into details of this one now because, well, some of you, most of you should know it, but those of you who don't and still want to take the course, please do study those ones because then Otherwise you have problems understanding further. Um, basically web 2.0 is a different story because it uh, in the, uh, from the nineties, it was 1.0 from the uh, beginning of the century, it became web 2.0 and um, it's uh, basically uh, all these platforms which enabled people to create content very easily. And, um, put it online without any kind of um, technical knowledge, for example. You don't need to know what is a server and how you structure HTML manually. You can just do it by, you can go on Twitter and open account there and start to publish. So this is about this. So it became very generally accessible. So it's, um, and there is basically software appeared. What is also very interesting about this for me, because <laughs> as I said, I, uh, I'm interested um, a lot in research and innovation, how this happened, because the technology for this was also existing already for decades. And why actually nobody had idea to put a system like Twitter, for example, in the 90s. Um, actually, technologically, there was no reason not to do it. All technology was there. Uh, well, I guess people were still mainly busy at this time making maybe better web browsers, inventing a mouse. So there were still like many things to figure out, but still technologically everything was there to create Web 2.0 applications, which uh, enable anybody to publish content without technical knowledge. But this Web 2.0 basically changed things dramatically. And um, well, if you want like what were the main four breakthroughs, 
is that the distinction between content consumers and content providers is blurred. So everybody can publish now on the web. So we get now really lots of data. Then you, we moved from the media for individuals towards media for communities and we blurred distinction between service consumers and service providers. And it's also now we have a systems which combine humans and machines in a new way, uh, uh, computation in a new way, for example, that you are accessing some services uh, provided by humans via computer interfaces. Yeah? So this is also something what you can think about. And this is also, um, well, you can be asked, for example, at um, at uh, exam or, um, well, I think it's quite a simple question. This is also, this is not, big, the, for this, I don't give you it as a homework, but we can, we just uh, give you example how we it can work. Uh, for example, for the next lecture, you could be reading some material and then we discuss it in the class, uh, but today we don't discuss, I just uh, give you examples. Um, so some limitations uh, that uh, basically, the, as you understand, of course, well, we talked about some motivation, well, why we need semantic web. And here the motivation is, of course, for web 1.0 and 2.0, finding relevant information is very difficult and uh, combining it, reusing it is very difficult. Yeah, so this is the, bottleneck and uh, why why actually then semantic web appeared semantic web is by the way also referred sometimes as a web 3.0 well because the web has limitations and um, for example if you were, would be going in the 90s or in the earlier days of this century and uh, typing in a keyword you would be getting um, for example you type in a Jaguar and you want to get information about car, but you will also get information about animals because the web does not really understand what you are looking for. It has, um, there is no meaning in the web, yeah? uh, in the sense that it's, there is no structure. Also, uh, especially when uh, the content production was mainly done by humans, uh, there was many things like spelling mistakes, multiple languages, um, some of them are still uh, challenges, or for example, if you are selling or buying something, yeah, for example, you or uh, renting or letting, for example, you look for an apartment to rent it, uh, and then you find an advertisement and you actually may find both, yeah. So it's, uh, if you do natural language search. So obviously there, there was some need for some more advanced structures for the web. So for example, in the, um, well, it's still the case for now, but uh, the interface is a bit old, of course, as you see, but uh, for example, the, the machine doesn't understand without semantics, for example, uh, is it, uh, what is this, is it title of the book or six edition is also part of the title or not? Uh, is it, uh, what is the, what is actually the price of the book? Well, there are two different prices. It's unclear, yeah. So there is, um, without structure, basically there is, difficulties in finding and combining information. So first people were trying to solve it in a way that uh, we take HTML pages, which were already somewhere created and we try to uplift them and at least put them in some way like in databases or XML. But of course, this is also not very optimal as we will see. And um, you can use uh, well technology like um, XSLT uh, transformation uh, and um, then apply and generate the data structures. Um, basically also when you try to combine information coming from different sources, it's a challenge, it's difficult, it's um, often, well, without basically semantic web, uh, it's, you need to deliver ad hoc solutions to do this integration. Uh, well, for example, for traveling, for planning a trip, uh, you need to combine information from many sources, which is not difficult, which is difficult. Uh, here, basically, what would be a, a, a better web and how to improve the web is basically to um, increase automatic linking uh, among data, then increase recalling precision and search and increase information and data, automation and data integration and increase automation in the survey life cycle. 
so basically for this adding semantics uh, would be a solution and here um, you have um, uh, also Tim Berners-Lee actually he is also well inventor of the web and also inventor of the semantic web because he's uh, after his job in uh, Switzerland uh, he moved to the US and opened um, W3C consort, uh, W3C consortium, uh, which is basically a um, uh, recommendation organization for semantic web uh, and web, uh, well, generally for web uh, recommendations, for example, for languages which you use on the web, starting from HTML to more advanced languages. So basically, uh, this is the um, well, was the story so far why we had um, the web in place? And just to check of the clock. <clears throat> yeah, that's. Um, I think we maybe should make now a break for fifteen minutes that you have. Um, uh, take a um, pause and maybe eat something or go for a coffee or whatever. And then I think we will, we would resume back again at uh, two o'clock. And then I would go through um, the basics of semantic web, which will define basically what the course is about. And then, um, and then we basically have another break for half an hour and then we go into seminar. So I would say then my side or have a nice, Coffee, pause, and see you at two o'clock. Back. Um, there is a question in the chat. Uh, how many people will be in each group? Uh, three to four, we recommend. I mean, one project actually will be a bit larger, so we would allow more people on this project, but generally three to four. It's kind of optimal group size. Okay, then see you at. Uh, Two o'clock, back. All right, so, um, I think we can restart. I hope then you can still hear me and then um, the connection is going fine. So I will again share my screen. Um, Uh, so we stopped basically well, uh, on the motivation of semantic web and we wanted to, um, well, it was clear that, well, obviously it did happen already, uh, but you already get the idea basically what was before, before semantic web uh, ha happened. And um, here, um, basically, um, well, you saw that the semantic web is basically um, uh, taking up this very, very large uh, growth of the web. Well, we have, um, say, two years ago, I found statistics that were uh, 4 billion users, so basically more than trillion pages. Um, there is many serious problems, information extraction, indexing, and uh, so on, and this is the semantic web. And um, semantic web was uh, came out uh, as a turn uh, in early, well, in the beginning of the century, the paper which made uh, semantic web say known to a broad audience was a paper by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, James Handler and Ora Hasila called the semantic web. It was in, uh, in Scientific American. Um, um, actually for the next, uh, for the next week, um, for the flipped classroom also, it would be a nice exercise to look at this paper. And uh, the, 
basically they defines the semantic web as an extension of the current web in which information is given a uh, well-defined meaning better enabling computers and uh, people to work in cooperation so you see that uh, it's basically it's something that builds on the um, existing web so it's not a new um, something very different it's basically based on uh, building on the same technology but which solves this information uh, interoperation problems, information um, um, search problems, and so on. And it's also for humans and for machines. So um, it's basically also called the next generation of uh, World Wide Web. It's sometimes referred to as Web 3.0. Um, it's extension of the current web and the backbone of semantic web are ontologies. At least that is how it was designed initially. It has a little bit changed over the years because data become structured data generally became more important. But let's uh, go again historically step by step what was going on. So on ontologies, we will have a separate uh, kind of block uh, in the course because it's a very important topic on how to structure information, how to organize it, and um, how to do ontology engineering. Generally, for now, you can just know that ontology, well, it comes originally from philosophy, uh, but it's um, uh, in computer science, this term basically immigrated and it's used in computer science and it can be um, followed, say, this definition, formal, explicit specification of a shared conceptualization. This is also what uh, I sometimes I put an exam, as an exam question uh, in one of some of the exam questions. And well, it, when people cannot provide this definition, this is, of course, quite bad because it's a very basic one. And um, here it's meant that uh, there is a machine readable with computational semantics that's uh, commonly accepted understanding shared uh, because, of course, I can, for example, design some XML schema and put it somewhere and then, but then if nobody agrees with what I designed, then it's not ontology because we cannot use it as a basis for information exchange, right? And it should be unambiguous and with this web actually helps a lot because you have URIs and they make, uh, they can refer to object uh, by in, in an ambiguous way yeah, uh, to any object, web page, sensor, whatever <clears throat> thing. So this is um, <clears throat> um, what basically is ontology is. Um, then that's the last the, in the slides we explain what it is. Then it's uh, basically um, it's a well-defined meaning for information, and all these points which I uh, explained that ontology is a conceptualization. It's explicit, so it's. Uh, clear what we are talking about, if we're talking about Jaguar, if it's a car or a cat, it's formal, it's shared. So um, this is the definition. And generally, um, you can represent also like visually, for example, like this, that um, there are some concepts, for example, a person, there is a relation between those concepts, uh, there is an axiom, and there is a property, well, for example, lecture has a lecture number, um, which is a kind of property, then there is, um, well, basically this is, can be considered as an ontology, and here you have a person, uh, which is a professor is a person, and um, professor holds lecture, student attends lecture, student is also a person, student has matricle num number, and professor has some research field where he or she is expert, and then every person has also name, uh, email address, and so on. Yeah. So this is the, for example, a very, very simple model of a domain. And uh, it can be considered as ontology because I think many people will agree uh, that, well, this is what is represented here is correctly. Yeah? That it's really like how it is in the world. So you see, it's also a bit of a subjective view yeah? uh, when you talk about ontology, because you can have, um, Ontologies actually doing contradictory things, and they would also be ontologies because maybe some group of people uses it to exchange information and considers it for right and another not, yeah. 
for example, well, in Russia, everybody thinks that Crimea is, or not everybody, but the official position that Crimea is part of Russia and um, in the world they say, well, it was illegal uh, what was done and it's not. So it's, uh, but these are two different, basically both have the rights to be ontologies because both models, because um, there are groups which are agreeing on them on both sides. Yeah. And this also makes uh, information processing not simpler, but um, that's the, um, um, here the challenge. Uh, there are different types of ontologies also, in fact, uh, like for, for example, some of our colleagues from Italy, like in Balzano, they are very good experts in these domains and they did many, uh, lots of research. And uh, for example, you can, it's clearly that some ontologies are quite reusable. For example, if you have a concept like space or time or event, that would be reusable all over and some of them are very applied. And then there you can also put, for example, task and problem solving ontology. For example, you can ontologize a process, um, how you, for example, solve a problem, what you are doing, what you are delivering. So, um, so basically there can be very different ontologies. Uh, in the course you will work with ontologies. I think in most of the projects involve some work with ontologies. So they will probably different depends on project to project you will do work with different ontologies, but you will see basically how they look like. Um, so based semantic web is basically about this. Uh, well, it's a lot has to do with information representation and reasoning. Because when, once you have the such structures, yeah, or like such ones, you can also reason on them. So you can actually apply uh, logics on top of them, yeah, which is uh, also a useful thing. And there is quite query languages and graph databases. So basically, well, uh, semantic web is about uh, creation, creation of annotations for uh, them. Um, objects which you talk about, for example, that I'm a lecturer and associate professor at University of Innsbruck, and this is the image of Innsbruck and so on, and basically you can all represent it. And then you can cross link it, yeah, for example, that also Innsbruck is in Austria and Austria is in Europe, and um, you can build various advanced models. And then you have, uh, you can um, query it with languages like Sparkle, um, which we will also cover. And again, I think I will do the basics because I have seen already already good languages, uh, good courses existing and um, good lectures on um, RDF Sparkle and some basic things. I think I will be providing you links to them. So we will be mainly on the lecture to discuss it and you watch them. Well, partly maybe also watch it, the lecture. We have to see what works best because I was now, of course, doing this course in this mode. And then, data integration over the web. And this is, of course, has to do a lot with applications. And for this, I will be bringing, I think, more of my content because it's kind of specific and how to integrate information. It's, um, or we will also do a lot in the project. I think you will do it a lot in practice. But then uh, that was actually the theory uh, and it was a vision. Also, you would read the paper of Tim Berners-Lee and see how it really fits together. Um, but something went differently. Um, well, for example, now we don't have always like data. It's still semantic, but it's a uh, line on the web and not always compliant to ontologies. Then it's also not always having, um, say, unique identifiers because there are application fields, for example, like in marketing, um, when you publish schema.org annotations on the website, well, some of you who develop websites maybe know meanwhile what is schema.org. And, um, and um, you see that basically, um, you, well, it's not a classical semantic web that in terms that you have a pointer and a unique identifier to some object there. Yeah. So this is something went basically differently comparing to the other vision, the initial vision of the web. And for example, well, on web 1.0, um, which again, maybe more, some of you remember when you were very small, if you search the web, you get something like this, you get a list of websites yeah, uh, as a search engine result. And um, 
And this was very, very long while because, uh, well, thematic web was as a vision came up in uh, 2001, as I said broadly. And then actually for maybe a decade or so, um, well, the big players like Google, uh, they were completely ignoring it and uh, or also Amazon and uh, Facebook, well, Facebook, there was no Facebook uh, at this time or there was, but in very early stage. And uh, basically then, well, they were saying, well, okay, this is the search result and it's actually okay. You, know, you were found, uh, maybe you're looking for the age of a person, but you don't get any structured information, maybe just images of the person and that's it. Uh, so it's only like in, uh, it almost took 11 years uh, that actually Google uh, started to uh, integrate semantic web in itself. And uh, since there, it basically only grew in, you know, and of course, for me, it was very good because I started really also with semantic web in the beginning of when, when it occurred, yeah, so I immediately went into the search area. And of course, well, I always believed in the vision, but of course it was sometimes kind of disappointing to, well, disappointing to see that it's so slow, but um, well, now it's basically, we have the case that we have Google using it and um, other companies also using knowledge graphs, which I will talk later on. So basically now Google is more like working on, uh, uh, after they said, well, actually we will integrate semantic web. Uh, they are working more like, a, query answer an engine, for example, you work, you go, and this is a query from 2015, and uh, well, did offensive, some of you also met him, at an uh, online communication course, maybe a little bit, and uh, well, you ask how old is when he was born, and um, five years ago, it was a query, and actually you get an answer, yeah, he is born, well, tomorrow is basically the birthday, and, and but he will be 60, and um, and um, yeah, and, and you get the age. Why? Because uh, because it comes from, um, as you may guess, it comes from some structured information. So it's not anymore like this. Look in the um, search, but more like this. And why? Because there is some structured information on the web line around which contains this information. That's October tenth, uh, nineteen sixty. Um, well, this information comes um, basically from the knowledge graph of Google, uh, from the semantic structure, and it knows that, well, birth is like, date of birth is this one, and it gives you an answer. Yeah? Uh, Google takes this information from various sources. Obviously, it's not so trivial how this knowledge graph is constructed, but essentially it's, um, it is working like this. Uh, or if you take some other, um, you can also ask in German and okay, you get a query. When was um, Larry Page born? You also get query for this. So um, you get all, all the information um, in a structured way. So, and this is basically how Google is working already since at least the last five years, uh, you get answers when you ask so you don't need to go anymore to web pages well for them it's also good because it's well it keeps the customer in the system um, then okay with maybe people it's clear okay if you put for example your page on wikipedia like it is the case for larry page or data fenzel or also many others uh, it is kind of okay, clear that it comes from there, it's structured, put in there, then maybe you can think just maybe for half a minute uh, from where well, this comes from, because this is like, well, probably Google is not creating it manually, eh? this is the local supermarket chain of our region. Um, so basically, um, this is also, of course, there is some Wikipedia data, but some also maybe not, uh, not everything could be on Wikipedia. So, um, so actually, well, how Google uh, constructs this knowledge graph is, of course, interesting. Well, you could think of different options, maybe that uh, the content comes from organizations, maybe the organizations published themselves such content, or um, 
is maybe Google itself creates such contracts from uh, content from somewhere, or uh, maybe the content is created in a structured form, maybe by some hackers who put this on the on the web, which is also um, a possibility. Yeah, uh, that it takes some sources, and or it maybe takes some structured content like Wikipedia and DBpedia. Well, essentially, Google, uh, of course, they don't tell exactly how they construct knowledge graph, and uh, but uh, there is semantic technologists working on it, and uh, and all the work for this is actually also done in the US. So you, if you are very very ambitious after this course and want to construct knowledge graphs in Google, you would actually need to go to Google US because it's done there. But uh, generally, they do take, uh, they count many characteristics when they construct such knowledge graphs which work behind the search engine and uh, they take both in uh, um, actually C and D rather mainly uh, for example uh, content from this structured content resources like Dpedia and Wikipedia because it's already quite trustable content um, because well you cannot put simply things on Wikipedia and dbpedia is a semantic version of wikipedia because people check it and it's quite quality controlled uh, but they also look at different things where because people can publish themselves uh, you can put online any kind of information you can publish themselves yourself schema.org files for example and google may take and consider them to include a knowledge graph so they if they for some reason consider the source as trustable for example they see it's a very trustworthy website and website published some structured data then they may take an integrated and knowledge graph yeah and how to define if it's trustworthy or not um, well of course they don't tell they don't really tell all up-to-date details all the time but more or less it's of course well there are some indicators right that's uh, possible to do so um but basically it leads that we also have some headless web now where you have the just uh, google knowledge graph and natural language processing and translation in the current web so it's not always uh, it's actually this um, semantic web technologies will start it it's very nicely with ontologies and they structure everything in uh, schemas with which people share understanding among each other but now it's it goes actually very well there are more and more technologies appearing and approaches and well knowledge graphs is the, um, one of the very hyped words currently or is basically uh, for for the data which is published so this structured interlinked data on the web which is not necessarily uh, in a sense like um, initially designed on semantic web that it's also headless web uh, so knowledge graph, um, well, Google knowledge graph, it contains, well, it's really huge. Well, you, you can imagine for many search engines, you get just reply. They started um, a few years ago, and actually it's not only Google, um, uh, with this initiative schema.org, um, it was by the big four search engines. So Google, Bing, uh, Yahoo, Yahoo was still big, bigger than now, <laughs> and Yandex, yeah, um, the, the Russian search engine. So these are like the ones which are mainly used. Of course, the Google is the most dominant one. Is but they basically they all support um, Schema.org, which is good because it really um, went to Asia and to the US and Europe and uh, Russia and well, basically really global, which is uh, very good and. Um, they all use the schema.org format, which is also headless, by the way. Yeah. So, for example, you see such uh, such things uh, all over. For example, you look for recipes uh, to cook or to for hotels, and then you see, for example, here like uh, stars and Bewertung and um, different details. And here you also even see some pictures um, from guacamole and so on. Uh, then it also even goes further. You can even in build some e-commerce applications and directly in Google, for example, hotel booking, which is 
like a web service in built and search engine, which, <laughs> um, and it's semantic. So you can really like um, find, oh, well, I want a four star hotel in Innsbruck and it will deliver you and you can even book it from there. So it really goes quite far. Um, or different well, annotations, they look like this. So it's, you have, um, well, for example, this one we like to show um, that uh, we were uh, involved because uh, in the, some earlier projects in the years, we experimented with putting semantic annotations uh, on different websites and uh, we're looking if they pop up in Google or not, because this is also, well, um, interesting, well, I think for everybody who develops web apps, and um, on this course, but we're also teaching online marketing courses and still do. And then um, it's this kind of test are different and for example, uh, interesting. And this one, for example, we got, uh, this is, was produced by our group and uh, Google actually uh, from Tourismus Verband, Touristic Association of Meyerhofen. And there is some specific hotel um, on this, um, web page promoting the region of Meyerhofen and actually this semantic schema.org markup, which we put on this website, Google showed, visualized it, which is nice because Google is also by itself deciding, of course, what to visualize and what not. And it's not always trivial when they act on it and how this is the challenge. Or you can also see like uh, in boxes, different events and, um, so it's very structured reply to your query about events, for example. And then you can go to some specific event. So basically, well, uh, obviously the interaction also has changed. You don't have any more like on the web, you have uh, um, interlinked documents and web browser and mouse, but you actually have much more. You, you also can build chatbots and uh, personal assistant, which knows all has all your data and can figure out what is the for example you've got a flight delay and uh, there is the reschedule and taking place automatically well if it's of course for now it's a very <laughs> very much from the past scenario but um, generally basically you can combine any kind of dynamic data on the fly and uh, do it also with chatbots here maybe you have a different scenario where you came maybe from across the border and want to find out where is the next station to test uh, for COVID um, infection that uh, you can reach to be on time with the current regulations because they ch change all the time. So essentially scenarios may be different, but uh, the fact is that when you have the data in structured way, this, the personal assistants can deliver you the requests and responses. So, um, and this is why it happened till also um, two, three, four years ago. Uh, it was a boom and still a boom in the chatbot industry. So uh, you have Siri, Cartana and so on and so forth. Also uh, one of the startups of our group uh, on LIM, they are doing um, chatbots to basically automate communication. And this is clearly based, uh, it's very uh, practical to build them based on semantics and um, knowledge graphs. Um, well, for example, you also have a chatbot at uh, University of Innsbruck, and this is also what uh, OnLIM is doing in particular, that uh, you can ask information about courses and you get a response here. Yeah? And this is clearly replaces uh, quite a, takes a human out of the loop and um, just for asking some facts, well, you don't need a human responding uh, for it really, no? It can be automated with a chatbot. And this is comes from the fact that you can structure information behind with ontologies and knowledge graphs. And then you have uh, conversational systems which are considerably at a, at a new level, yeah, which are really intelligent. So this is a still a very booming area and uh, I think we also put some projects related. And of course that goes into, actually now everybody wants also to go even like companies like Amazon, yeah, they go and uh, also put this device physically in your home, um, which um, have um, like this one or like this one that you can talk to the assistant, uh, to Siri or to Alexa or 
to Google. Um, yeah, so basically the headless uh, web uh, is the case here that the content gets extracted from other pages and directly represented and uh, there is no URIs involved. Yeah, so in a sense, well, I still told that you should learn URIs and HTML and uh, this language is related to web.1, but in fact, well, if you just work with, well, applications like headless web, you wouldn't even see much of your eyes. So it's, it's really changing it's, um, and it's also interesting, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so maybe in, uh, say in five years from now, we even, even now I'm, I'm talking a lot like in the historical perspective, okay, there is the web and then semantic web and, uh, um, maybe we have more, uh, or maybe the next edition of this, uh, because eventually we probably will have a new curriculum and we also will have a new names for the lectures on the master course. So I think we are already thinking about new names. It may be even the case that it's one or one of the last ones, uh, which we held it in this way as a semantic web lecture, but, um, because after this, we probably will have new courses, which are more um all about knowledge graphs for example or some similar courses which are already reflect in this um, that there is many new ways to represent knowledge and in fact the, the vision of semantic web also a bit diverged but also evolved um, and um, essentially same ideas but in a different way so um, what was here basically it basically destroys at the same point of time some businesses because Google wants to well build if you, if Google can inbuild services and Amazon actually we have a small problem uh, that um, maybe potentially some players go out of the market because um, well Google and Amazon and other companies um, will take a share uh, th their share um, especially also they combine it now with currencies and um, in Amazon they yeah that's they, that was Libra and or um, well, in Facebook um, and in Amazon anyway they have Amazon pay so it's really they can open a complete supermarket on their own without any service providers yeah, and actually consume e-commerce completely so it's we may be running into issues that we have very big players, but this is also what you see yourself, I guess, as a user. Um, yeah, something also nice to mention that uh, well, uh, it's basically still developing the semantic web and also Tim, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was also recognized as a computer scientist, even though people argue, well, which kind of computer science is this, uh, that you combine things which already existed, yeah, and the hypertext existed, internet existed. Well, humans could collaborate since always, but um, but basically it's nice that uh, also, well, in this way he was recognized. Of course, it's uh, showing that it's also appreciation of the innovation. Uh, so basically for the, um, for the homework and or uh, but I will send I will be sending for for the lectures every time um, a separate email that all of you are following even when you missed the lecture that you know what the task for the next lecture is and in this case I would um, ask you to read um, the original semantic web vision uh, which I give always to read on this course in every well, because this is how it started and then and then also to see how to invent the future in a sense that uh, well i would ask you to read two papers uh, both by tim berners lee basically the original paper about semantic web from 2001 and one of his more recent uh, statements he was um there was an article in Bloomberg and he was saying, well, actually semantic web and uh, the web, especially the web actually failed in many aspects and evol evolved uh, not really how he wanted it to be. It's like his child, which is <laughs> basically not um, evolved in a way that uh, he initially imagined. And there was some discussion in this interview, what he, he was talking. 
in 2017. So um, I would put then uh, two of these papers for you in the OLED to read for the next lecture. And this is what we can discuss. And basically uh, that you should uh, have answers for the questions, uh, basically what was envisioned then in 2001 and what is realized now and uh, what is still not realized and also what we uh, what happens basically now uh, positively and negatively and even also talk about now like 2020 and even a bit like uh, in the future what you think will be the developments like would be the initial vision realized or not yeah so this would be them uh, I think with discussion we should reopen the next lecture with um, this one so I would not ask you to read it now because well the time I think is not so large, but uh, uh, so uh, maybe I go still and uh, check in the chat or with you how you are. Let's stop sharing and um, if you have any questions up to now or if you also maybe any feedback. Um, or any indications in the middle of the hour. Because then what I will do still for today, I would show the um, uh, basically a very brief overview where we start. And then uh, as anyway, the next two weeks for the lectures, we will have individual meetings. You can also on, use this individual meetings to ask any kind of questions. You When you start to read about basic technology, uh, which is um, uh, semantic web. Well, basically, we would need to go in basic representation language, start with RDF. And okay, if some of you know already RDF, well, awesome, then you don't need to, to learn much. You can already work more on projects. If some of you are, say, no less, and uh, you also may have questions on some basic technologies on uh, HTML, XML, URIs, whatever. So again, I would just give you contents for this, um, for this uh, two or three weeks that you can watch also for RDF. There is uh, videos by other people and they are quite good. So I wouldn't need to repeat myself um, and you wouldn't need to sit <laughs> with everybody on the, on the same slot. So you can watch them basically at home at your own speed. And then when we have individual sessions for which anyway, we need to schedule appointment with every group. Maybe that will be also on Fridays because, well, I guess all of you will have time on uh, 16, 23 and uh, 30th of October. And then we can, uh, you can also come with any kind of questions. I will also ask you maybe a couple of questions just to figure out how fast you are. And maybe I still need to go into the some basic contents when I talk to you as I see. Uh, so let's try to do it this way. Um, I think it's the optimal way because we are still we are quite big uh, still, but uh, but we cannot interrupt much because of this settings. Then I think also not every question. I think some of you are faster than the others in sense. Some of you know more than the others, and you will have different questions. Uh, but okay, um, I think also if you form groups which uh, have different backgrounds, it's also okay because then you can already answer a little bit each other's questions <laughs> before you come to the lectures. Good, then I will continue and show a little bit more about semantic web before we finish this hour. Um, So this you would need to read. Uh, basically, um, uh, semantic web is a lot of about data and the basic technologies, very, very, very basic technologies are um, query languages like Sparkle, um, OWL uh, for and RDF for modeling data and also tools, for example, like Protege for ontology engineering. And um, initially, well, again, the first uh, you may want to see just how um, of course, now the applications are more fancy, but the essence is always the same. For example, this is how you can visualize um, uh, a person. Um, this is a um, profile of Tim Berners-Lee, of the inventor of the web and semantic web. And there is um, basically a model saying, okay, this is the person. Uh, it has um, 
um, public home page. It has a home page. Uh, it has um, uh, some type uh, mail, and uh, it uh, belongs to the class person. So this person is basically an uh, uh, anthology. So the, for example, we saw this professor and student um, example of anthology and lecture. And so this is, for example, also can be anthology. This is, uh, for example, a very, very simple anthology, uh, friend of a friend anthology. And you can basically um, just visualize it in this way by showing all the attributes that Tim Berners-Lee works at W3C. And, um, and then you can browse, for example, if you want to see what you can state about the person, uh, you would get a kind of uh, a schema like this. So it, the person is a class um, and there are subclasses um, and uh, there is some disjoint. So there is a lot of, um, in the semantic web languages already some notations taken from, for example, from object-oriented programming because there you also were dealing with classes and subclasses and and uh, also with logics, yeah, because you had also disjoint, for example, well, you don't understand, you understand what it is that person is just disjoint from a document, for example, <laughs> you can state it explicitly and because otherwise it depends on the reasoner, uh, then um, it's also nice questions at exams uh, asking such ones and then would person be recognized as a document in this and this scenario, yeah, under this reasoner with this language and under this assumption. So this is what kind of questions maybe when we go into details of different languages. Uh, generally, there are also tools. Well, for example, this one is quite nice. Uh, it's online and it's a platform for uh, um, an annotation. So you can create um, things out of text. I mean, if you go to this platform, um, uh, well, I think we anyway will go it later. Uh, and do it in some other when they study semantic annotations. But just uh, in this, uh, just a few minutes, I want to show that there is actually a bunch of tools, which are also there are many commercial tools existing and uh, they are nice and they uh, can be used. For example, for natural language processing, there is a, a framework gate uh, to analyze um, natural language and for uh, repositories, um, graph databases, there are also many of them, uh, like GraphDB, but also other ones. And um, generally also there is a concept of linked open data. So this is also uh, basically a concept has to do with semantic web. And uh, this is the, especially governments and um, different organizations, they are publishing semantic web as, um, data sets as linked open data and they interlinked. So they are in this classical way, they are uh, identifiable and you can um, have a sparkle endpoint for your data set and you can query this data set. For example, um, the um, government of Austria may want to publish information about, um, for example, situation about coronavirus uh, infections in the country so that other countries can collect this information process and, for example, decide whether they want their citizens to travel there uh, with quarantine or without quarantine or what is the policy should be. So, for example, this kind of applications and this is often done with just publishing data in structured formats and the right way to publish data is essentially linked open data. Um, so uh, the first with the linked open data publishing was uh, US and UK governments, but then every, every government of nearly every developed countries uh, were following up with this. So Austrian government also has linked open data on their government portals and Tyrolean government, well, the Tyrolean government has some structured data about linked open data, I'm not sure uh, because um, well, they don't have too many human resources to produce such data, even though they are well aware of it and, of course, I also would be interested. So, um, well, for example, this uh, in the UK, they do it already since 10 years. And uh, you can basically, uh, the data is lying around um, in uh, structured and resource description framework, and you can um, query it with Sparkle, with query language. 
And basically, well, these ones we should learn first because they are the most basic. They are not even though the most, um, well, they're quite um, verbose in a sense, the Sparkle queries. I mean, there are easier ways also to query things. For example, GraphQL, we will also look at this um, because Sparkle for many developers, I mean, you will still have to, to learn it, but for many developers, it's very, um, well, it takes a lot of time to produce a Sparkle query. But it's not it's not difficult. It's basically a bit similar to SQL, like from um, relational databases you may have learned. And when you see Sparkle, you actually realize probably very quickly what it is about. So, but essentially, all uh, data, public data, which is published, ideally it should be a linked open data. This is like a recommendations from recommendation from WCC, and this is what. Uh, also governments or any kind of organizations that publish this data, they try to get to this standard. Um, well, and there is this, this five-star scheme. So first, uh, the data would be just available on the web. Uh, this is already good because, well, hiding data doesn't help us to share information. And then if it's uh, available in some machine-readable structure data like Excel instead of um, image, then it's already better. Yeah? If it's in a non proprietary format, uh, so like in a format which is not connected with some organization or a product uh, like a CSV instead of Excel, it's even better. And then four star, if it uses open uh, standards from W3C, like URS, RDF, and Sparkle, uh, so people can point at your things. Um, and then if you link uh, your data set to other people's data sets to provide context, it's even better that you can um, say, for example, uh, well, I created, for example, my data set about, uh, well, for example, I want to, to make my lecture global, uh, open for everybody that uh, anybody can join on Zoom me on this course. Uh, maybe next year or sometime in the future. And then I just publish uh, structure information about my lecture that, okay, it runs on Fridays afternoons and um, um, then some keywords on which topics I study, then um, how to join and uh, this kind of information and that, uh, that it also runs from University of Innsbruck. And then I publish it on the web and I link, uh, for example, to um, DBpedia, uh, which already models Innsbruck and maybe some concepts from computer science to which I can connect and say, well, my lecture is about this concept about semantic web. So semantic web is surely also on Wikipedia and on DBpedia. So I can link to other data sets and then it's already um, systems understand. Uh -huh. So she means this semantic web, which is described in Wikipedia on semantic web page. And then people don't have ambiguity about this and can find my data set also better, especially if some other ones also link to, for example, DBP, they links me back and says, well, if you want to take semantic web course, you can go on Friday afternoon in Zoom. So um, basically it's more or less, as you see, it works like with the normal web, just on the structure level of information. And this is what we will be learning in the languages and the query languages for this one to represent this information. And then also newer developments like Headless Web and GraphQL and um, Schema.org and so on. Um, generally, you should be um, uh, linking. Um, well, this is a good practice for data linking. Uh, for linked data, actually, there is also like a specific courses and books. But generally, well, you should. Um, this URIs, they are for everything. Um, not only for documents, so you can also put a URI on, um, on um, for example, um, a thing, for example, on a vacuum cleaner. Yes, for, or for example, if you want for some reason to control your coffee machine or your stove from remote, you can actually put a URI on your stove and turn it on and off how you want automatically. This is all possible on the current application. Yeah? There are even like applications like this, like Thermomix. Um, they allow you to control the, your cooking process out of your um, out of your mobile phone remotely, and um, 
You can also put a unique URI on it and I'll give also other success to it if you want. Yeah? So you can really come up with funny applications. But essentially you need well to identify objects and you need to be able to reference this and uh, you, these languages allow you to do it. Um, so I was mentioning already a few times DBpedia. Uh, DBpedia is basically is um, kind of big, well, because uh, as you imagine in the beginning of semantic web, it was very, very difficult uh, to convince people uh, to use it. Yeah. Okay, I was convinced from the very beginning, but not everybody and many people were not getting the point. And there were many things, well, for example, they, just the first things like this, people were starting to put uh, just like this, uh, structured information about themselves, like a friend of a friend ontology. And then there were uh, also tools because technology guys were convinced and they were developing the tools, of course, uh, in any case, also early. Because the, when there are no tools, also people don't work with technology. If there is no reason to do Sparkle, then who will do Sparkle? And then I uh, linked open data. So this government sector came. Uh, and then uh, this DBpedia was also a very good success story, uh, also already quite some years ago. But generally, they what they did is that, and they're still doing this because it's a community effort and a nonprofit association based in uh, Leipzig in Germany. Uh, they took all, uh, they uh, uh, put uh, out the structured data from Wikipedia and did a semantic representation of it. So, uh, and uh, I think it's mainly, so their, their effort was one of the ones which actually showed, actually is not, is possible to create a knowledge structure for uh, the whole world without involving, well, without asking uh, people to model it, yeah, because people do it volunteer on Wikipedia and you can just transfer it uh, with some, well, information processing to DBpedia and then you can query um, very advanced questions uh, with having all this information available. And uh, well, as you know, Wikipedia, they even drove uh, this um, Encyclopedia Britannica out of business. Um, so it's really, um, well, kind of dramatic change here because Encyclopedia Britannica, they were structured information about the whole world and they stopped to exist a few years ago because uh, now people find all the facts on Wikipedia and DBpedia made it semantic. So uh, you can basically have access to the world knowledge and structure it as a knowledge graph and link data uh, you have a sparkling point for it. Yeah? So some of you probably will be also using it for the project. So it was kind of also was so clear when they did it. So I think also after this, Google actually started to consider this seriously and um, integrated it into their system. So it, that's why it took, it takes so long to get. But you can ask with this very various queries, for example, um, uh, what is the population of the city in which Anna Fenzel lives? So uh, without even naming Innsbruck, but uh, as you, for example, I put information somewhere about myself that I live in Innsbruck, then it can be collected from there. And um, in DPpedia, you can check that Innsbruck has, um, well, uh, close to 130,000 inhabitants or on which elevation I live or who is the mayor of the city where I live. And um, you get answers for all of this, which is uh, very good. Yeah, You don't need to combine information uh, from different sources, the system can do it for you and give you a specific answer. So uh, this is, of course, a huge effort that it's, it's hundred, uh, well, over almost 130 languages. Uh, it's almost, well, vast majority of the languages which are available at all on the earth are present there. Um, and this is also the managed to construct everything in consistent ontology and uh, mainly you find there are persons, places, creative works, organizations, species, and uh, diseases are also popular. Um, so it's actually a very huge knowledge graph as you understand or link data set, which is also available via Sparkle endpoints and uh, also used heavily, very heavily by Google and other companies to construct their knowledge graphs. Um, but you can find basically the Sparkle endpoint and for linked data sets for any kind of uh, 
things like, for example, somebody create, there are many also enthusiasts who create any kind of data sets. Maybe you also create in your project one or another data set. Well, somebody here, for example, writes email. Uh, we did a data set about um, um, between our worlds. Uh, it's about anime series and movies. So you can really, really find very, very, very details, data sets, of course, of different quality, but for many domains already very, very good quality data sets are existing. For example, for biological and medical domains, it's extremely good qualities because the doctors and uh, uh, scientists use it, these data sets professionally and they also exist as ontologies and linked data. But you can also find, well, this one is um, about anime and somebody constructed it, but still has like over 14,000 anime, which is probably quite representative here. Yeah? The one who knows can judge. But so basically you can see uh, many developments in this area. Um, and um, it enables to do data integration. Um, so basically to do merge identical resources, for example, um, I think that's the last thing I show for today in the lecture. Let me stop here. But for example, you have two data sets which have um, about the same book. Uh, for example, this is data set. It's structured according to some ontology. It has a um, unique identifier. And you see some details about the book and somebody who wrote the book. And um, let's say you have another data set about the same book, but in French. And now they align separately. But what you want to do is basically to uh, merge those two together. And um, this is how they are located like next to each other, but because they have the same URI, yeah, this is why URIs are important. This is why <laughs> actually, well, I also don't drop this, um, even though you will see much of the content is produced for the, well, I consider also schema.org as semantic web and all its new branches, but still with this URI-based uh, concept is very important, uh, for example, to do this kind of integration that you have um, identify, uh -huh, it's the same object, and then um, you can actually merge this object based on um, equivalence and URIs, yeah, because otherwise there is some data line around. So. You see, uh, same URI, so it must be about the same book. And the system can put it together, well, automatically, yes, because uh, URI is the same. And um, maybe if there is some human in the loop involved and say, well, there is um, uh, one um, original language of um, the book and another one is a French translator, you can indicate which is which or what is the relation between those. And then you can basically merge this knowledge graphs and in one knowledge graph, and then you can run queries based on, uh, on uh, two knowledge graphs. So you can say, give me the title of the original book, even when you have uh, it in um, French, for example. It's this one, by the way, is still use case not resolved yeah, because uh, it's still not working, even though it was original vision. So this is example of still, which is kind of not very good because this uh, integration across different languages is probably more complex or may maybe not so many people use it very often. But uh, at least I, I'm not seeing very good applications for this particular example. But, uh, but generally, well, the integration on the web does look like this. And this um, basically semantic web, if you try to illustrate it, um, it's as an interlinked, uh, because they're interlinked, as you saw, well, you we combine two different data sets in one um, knowledge graph. We saw that they, it's interlinked. Um, and if you, uh, there is the same team in LabTech, they also from time to time try to visualize the uh, linked open data cloud diagram. I took one of the, well, they don't do it like every day, of course, or not every month, but uh, once in a while they do it. So this is from 2017, it's still one of the recent ones. And you see it's like very, has really, really many data sets. This one, central one is um, DBpedia, so many data sets linked to DBpedia. Um, 
but it was a, a bit well tr uh, trying to create this picture it was a bit because people were doing the same kind of pictures in the 90s when there was web and there were just a few machines and you can visualize them on one um, on one picture now nobody is doing it because it's too big so um, I also wait like all the time that they stop to do it for for this uh, interlinked data sets picture because well it's already kind of I think there is lots of already hidden things and um, maybe smaller ones they even don't take into account so it's it's already getting quite there that it doesn't make any more sense to visualize it because semantic web is there and there are really many interlinked data sets yeah so this is basically how we came from and uh, well I would say starting from 2010 if you go up uh, on this um, picture then you have uh, uh, from 2010 well Google started to use it and, and it went really really mainstream because before there were like all early adopters um, like um, well this is already bigger adopters around this time um, uh, and before it was still like um, maybe for almost 20 years people were just developing you know like um, representation languages, query languages, uh, life sciences were early adopters. They used, for example, OWL uh, already in uh, very early, just when became uh, recommendations, they were already using it because they really have the need to structure a lot, many complex data, for example, of uh, genome of human or animal genome data. So this is basically this thing. And these knowledge graphs are Again, it's a new term which appeared a couple of years ago, uh, very, very prominently. Essentially, it's still about the same kind of technology, which we have with semantic web and uh, headless web and linked open data. Um, but it's a kind of a new name because, well, it also reflects the point that uh, many big companies started to build these graphs. Like uh, everybody of them has now Google, Amazon, Facebook. So everybody has a knowledge graph in there. So there are many expectations on this one. And this is a so-called Gartner hype curve, hype cycle for emerging technologies. So knowledge graph there two years ago appeared as emerging technology. And this uh, basically life cycle means that um, hype cycle, it's called um, well, when a new technology appears, people have a lot of expectations that it will solve all the problems, it will be very great and bring a lot of value. Um, then it goes like up, 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 so expectations are growing and then people at some point of time realize, aha, uh -huh, actually it's not really um, as great as we thought or we overestimate it and then it goes down, yeah. And then it starts to be at some point of time, uh, people understand, okay, actually for this and this problem, it was not so bad. So it goes in this slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity, and then it becomes basically, it finds its place, yeah. And it's basically all technologies are developing like this, and they do this um, at Gartner, this hype cycle curve every year. And two years ago, they placed knowledge graph here. So it was just like on the rise. Now it's actually like very much on the rise. So it's very, very, very <laughs> hyped now term, yeah, knowledge graphs, um, because people have really, yeah that it will be the it's it will be the basis for everything uh chatbots will work on it and um, all the bigger um platforms of may all major web companies anyway are working already on knowledge graphs so um basically now it, it looks like according to them that knowledge graph people think that knowledge graph will really solve all the problems and be everywhere in every imaginable part of life which is maybe not um, be completely true <laughs> because we know how the technologies are evolving because we know then we see some again limitations of knowledge graphs and um, and then again there will be something new and knowledge graphs will be in the productive plateau of productivity at the end so um, I think for today then we are actually done with the lecture I think it's also a good um, good um, point to finish that we are working in a very <laughs> promising field um, or at least we have a very high expectations of what we can do with knowledge graphs in 2020 uh, and then um, I would say we just make a half an hour break and then we go into seminar and I will send you a follow-up email what we do in the next lecture with some materials and I put also materials on the all it so that you can um, actually start to work with them in order to study.
Okay, so um, good. Is there a short question that can be asked? Otherwise, we go in the seminar in half an hour, and then you can also ask questions there. Um, for seminar, we use the same link, so I will just um, stop it and and so then see you at um, three thirty back again. <laughs>